Hi, and welcome again to the Diaspora segment of Liberty Weekend. I am Arthur James Brooks. Today we bring you reports and stories of our Nigerian and African people's diaspora overseas. We celebrate how African individuals have excelled outside their own environments, and we also look at how our Nigerian and African culture and lifestyles are perceived outside Nigeria. Firstly, I mentioned in the last show that we would bring you movie footage of the 2022 Powerlist Black Excellence Awards Gala at the Savoy Hotel in London on the 28th of October last year. So let's watch. The room is full of success stories. People who made it from humble beginnings to running and even owning £100 million companies. And one of them is Tevin Tobin, CEO of transport and logistics company GV Group. He turned a £500 investment into a large global successful business. He explained why the event is significant. This is twofold. I think number one, I think, is to celebrate the greatness of this country. Um, to also celebrate the achievement of black people in this country. And I think what you find is that actually in the midst of this economic downturn, people have been positive and people are focusing on still how they will try and find a better tomorrow. And that has to be something you have to celebrate. 100 power listees are being honoured here today. Not everyone is here. Some of the people on the list are very, very well known, such as Edward Enenfell, the editor of British Vogue, the actor Idris Elba, and the musician Stormzy. Others you'll only know if you're in their industry. The list is published annually, with nominees judged by a panel of leading black doctors, lawyers, and company directors. As well as celebrating achievements, people here are enjoying an array of entertainment and food, and simply catching up with friends. Featured in the top 10 of this list is Sandy Okoro. She's the Group General Counsel at Standard Chartered Bank. She was formerly with World Bank. Her personal journey came with its own obstacles. You know, I face the kind of usual challenges of discrimination because of gender and race. Um, but some of the biggest challenges came from inside my head, where I thought I couldn't do things but I forced myself to do them. Um, and so I always, I often say that you get in your own way um, and I just chose not to get in my own way and to stretch myself and to just go with my ambition. But fast forward to Nigeria where the options were. The brainchild behind the list is Michael Aboda, CEO of Powerful Media, now in its 17th year. He defended the need for such a list. I can give you numerous examples, but let's just take the FTSE. There is no chair, there is no CEO, there is no CFO, there is no COO of any FTSE 100 companies right now who is of African or African Caribbean heritage. This is great to see. People succeed in reaching the top of their field. But the question still remains. When will there be a time when there won't be a need for a list like this? Gina Talo, BBC News, London. I hope you spotted some of our own Nigerian people. Now, good all. Now, again from the United Kingdom, we look at an old issue that was kept in the dark for many years. About 104 years, to be precise. Way back in 1919, just after the end of the First World War, in Liverpool, in the northeast of the UK, my hometown, I'm ashamed to admit, there were race riots, and not just confined to Liverpool. These incidents were never talked about for years and were certainly not included in history books. Watch this short documentary shown on the BBC in UK about those sad days. I loved history in school, but what I got taught didn't resonate with me. I got taught names of kings and queens, of princes and princesses, but nothing about anybody who looked like me. 1919 was a year of change, instability and uncertainty. All over the UK, race riots broke out. Five people got killed, dozens were injured, and we're still living with this legacy. Did I learn about the 1919 race riots in school? No, I can't say I did. There's more so about British white soldiers that we learned about. I did not learn about the 1919 riots during my school period. This is the story of a British lynching 
the alt history you don't learn in school. A hundred years ago, Britain had won the war, but had been hit hard economically. When millions of soldiers, sailors and airmen returned from the front lines expecting a hero's welcome and to settle back into their old lives, they were met with job shortages and mass unemployment. Until the First World War, Britain's black population was minimal. It was around 10,000 people scattered around the country, but concentrated in the port towns like Liverpool and Cardiff. One paper said they live in distinct foreign colonies. Another call it the Negro Quarter and even Nigger Town. People began to look suspiciously at these newcomers. The black and Asian population became an easy target for their frustrations, despite suffering from the many same economic hurdles. They were blamed for undercutting wages. These soldiers would have been like working or lower class, like white men who've come back after what years of strife and hardship in the struggle which they had, but then having their anger of no, rather than oh, it's not your government's problem. It's because these black guys are here. White workers began to demand changes. In Liverpool, blacks were sacked because whites refused to work alongside them. I think it's just fascinating how people's lives can literally be just like turned upside down just at the whim of other people's decisions like, beyond their control. It's weird because it's still going on today in terms of immigration. Just as tensions were rising about jobs, there was another problem. Some people didn't like the idea of racial mixing. In Cardiff, the press noted the sex problem, saying interracial relationships were repugnant and produces a state of violent resentment on the part of the relatives of the misguided girls and women. So all of this started based on the fact that white women thought the black men were superior to white men. They're ours, not yours. They're meant to be for us. You're not meant to have opinions in terms of the women. They're thinking well, they're not, you're meant to have opinions, you're not meant to have ideas, you're not meant to have eyes for anyone else but us. On the 5th of June 1919, in a pub on George Street in Liverpool, a fight broke out between a group of Scandinavian and a group of black sailors. But when the police arrived, guess what? They only arrested the black sailors. Nearby, a mob begins to gather. Meanwhile, 24-year-old Charles Wooten, who was not part of the riot, suddenly became a target of the mob. Charles is hunted through the city by two policemen and the mob. He arrived at Queen's Dock and somehow he ended up in the water. A crowd of as many as 300 people began to throw rocks at him as he tried to swim away. Bystanders stood, watched and shouted, let him drown. Charles Wooten was murdered, a victim of the race riots of 1919. He was lynched. Hearing the story of Charles made me feel <clears throat> angry and frustrated um, that this happened, but also disappointed in how it has been remembered. It's just another one in the list of many names and many unnamed people that have been killed due to racism. When I was a kid, my grandma said to me, if you're afraid of the monster under the bed, then call it out. And that became my way to run towards things, to confront them. But what could Charles do? He had an angry mob of 300 people intent on killing him. He was murdered in plain sight. This was not a local phenomenon. Similar events took place all across the UK. Not only immigrants were targeted, but anyone who associated with them. In Cardiff, a mob stripped a white woman who was married to a black man and knocked out her front teeth with a baseball bat. When the chaos began to settle, the government's response was to fear a black backlash. They wanted to get rid of the black immigrants, but even paid for them to leave. Sadly, many of those who were repatriated, who fought for this country, would have felt a massive sense of injustice about being sent away from what they considered to be their motherland. Their sense of Britishness was not enough to convince the authorities or the general public that they had the right to stay here. What's worse, in many cases, they were blamed for the riots of 1919, despite having to defend themselves from white mobs. No one was convicted for the murder of Charles Wooten. We hope and pray such does not happen again. Now, Donald Trump, the very controversial former president of the USA, was not known for his love of Nigeria, nor indeed Africa referring once to African people as coming from S-hole countries, nor was he kind to those from Arab or Muslim countries.
Yes, unbelievably, on the 12th of November 2002, his daughter Tiffany married a Nigerian Lebanese young man, Michael Boulos, 27 years, born and brought up and educated in Lagos, here in Nigeria, of Arab Lebanese parents. His father moved to Nigeria in 1936 and set up motorcycle factories in Lagos. Michael alone is said to be worth $17 million. No, not Naira, $17 million. Now watch the following images and videos from their high society wedding at mar -el lago the luxury hotel resort home of Donald Trump in Florida, USA. Hope you enjoyed this show. Please contact me on WhatsApp on the number on your screen for your comments and even your requests. See you again next week. Bye.